This video was brought to you by my patrons. Thanks! So, back in 2020, when I made my Jojo Rabbit video, I quoted a Holocaust film scholar named Rich Brownstein about the prevalence of righteous Gentile films. The quote was from an article I found, but I did do a little research on the guy since it sounded like he was writing a book on Holocaust films and that would be more comprehensive than Wikipedia. The book was not yet published at the time, so I went about my business. Then, by happenstance, this year, somebody sent that video to Mr. Rich Brownstein himself. He reached out to me, and now I'm going to interview him. And I know it's a heavy subject matter, but I am going to avoid using graphic footage, so it shouldn't be too visually upsetting. Also, stick around until after the interview for a little update on the channel. Hello, Rich Brownstein. Can you tell viewers a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, hi, OK. Hello. Uh, I, uh, I'm a lecturer. Supposedly, I'm an expert in a very solemn subject, the Holocaust. Uh, I lecture, uh, I have lectured at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the World Center for Holocaust Remembrance since 2014. And my specialty is Holocaust films and how to use them and the history of them. And, um, uh, and I've written a lot of articles about Holocaust films and, and speak a, a lot book. about them. Oh yeah, I wrote a book. Funny, thanks for asking. You wrote a whole I book. A, I have a whole book. Holocaust Literally, cinema. you wrote the book Simply. on Holocaust cinema. I did. Just published. Just, nice. just 2011, 2021, 400 films, um, 443. And of course, my greatest honor was um, that somebody sent me one of your videos, and I ended up in your video. <laughs> <laughs> And I had no idea that you knew who I was, and I had no idea who you were, but but it's been a wonderful uh, journey since then. So Now, uh, I was going to ask as well, um, how did you end up with the very specific expertise of Holocaust cinema? Like, how did this become your, your oeuvre? It was a backdoor thing. I've been studying the Holocaust uh, since I was a kid, since I was say 15, 16 years old, and got really interested in it. And uh, was on the board of the Oregon Holocaust Center when I was in my 20s, taught the Holocaust uh, to a religious school, continued to learn about it, even when I went to Hollywood and uh, had a company there. Um, I was always learning about the Holocaust. And I moved to Israel. I sold my company, moved to Israel. And in 2003, and eventually I had a student who uh, was on a gap year program. She was 18. Uh, and my cousin told me that she was taking a Jewish film course. And I asked her what the film was. And she said, Private Benjamin. And I was aghast because it's not a Jewish film. And so I went to the educational director of a program. And I told him, I will teach for free a class about Holocaust film. So the kids have an alternative to this silly cl other class. And so they accepted it. And uh, so I was teaching a college course accredited by American Jewish University in Los Angeles uh, and developed the entire, uh, my entire method, uh, the categories that I use and, and um reviewing films and and how i feel about them and then yad vashem saw my work and thought it was a, a wonderful thing for educators who come to israel for uh three weeks uh that they should have a class uh an hour and a half class about what to do with films so uh i i then one day decided i would write a book and fortunately, there was a pandemic, so I had time. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, I think with that, let's get into the movies. And we're going to start with some of the worst movies made about the Holocaust. And we're going to make jokes about them because they're bad. Uh, <laughs> so let's start. Let's start with Getting Away with Murder. Getting Away with Murder uh was part of a spree that dan Aykroyd was on in the 19 uh 1990s where he made in a 
in a two year, three year period from 1994 to 1996, he made 13 films uh, with an average IMDb rating of 5.3. And this was one of them. This film has Dan Aykroyd, who's an ethicist, and he finds out that there's an ex Nazi a retired Nazi living in his American town. And that's played by Jack Lemon from the apartment. Jack Lemon, the yes. great Jack Lemon, at the end of his career, defiled himself in this film by playing a Nazi who was bad at everything, a bad actor, a bad everything, bad German accent. Hello. I wonder if I might bother you for an easy favor. His daughter with a bad German accent is Lily Tomlin. Thank you. We are very pleased that so many of you showed up today. They say that Mr. Brownell is one of the top immigration lawyers in the country. And Dan Aykroyd goes to kill Jack Lemon, believes it was the wrong person. He marries Lily Tomlin as some sort of a, uh, uh, to get the money and the thing back to where it should be to set the record straight. And then he finds out that he really wasn't. And the highlight is, they're on their honeymoon. They're in a on a cruise or something, and she says with this um, horrible German accent. So you kill the father, and then you fornicate the daughter. You kill the father. No, Inga, please. And then you f you fornicate the daughter. No, 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 no. It's just bad filmmaking all around. Um, but there is a good thing about it, which is I then went to see who could have made this horrible movie. And the director of it was a guy who I'd never heard of. He was friends with Gary Marshall and Penny Marshall and that whole thing. And then I saw that he was the HR person in Big. Getting Away with Murder is a great film because it got me to see Big again. <laughs> That's the best I can say about it. Next, let's talk about The Devil's Arithmetic. There was a book that was really well received. Yeah, from 1980 by Jane Yolen. Good. And people loved it. Yeah. And one person in particular who loved it more than anybody else was Benjamin Braddock, otherwise known as Dustin Hoffman. He bought the rights, executive produced with Mimi Rogers, this... Um, this time travel. Okay, film. so yeah. I'm gonna say, because you have a thing about the cheeseburger scene, I have a thing about the Wizard of Oz in that scene, because this movie took place in the 40s, and Wizard of Oz is a movie from the 30s. And 39. The, yeah, okay. And the book is even older than that. And I'm like, I don't know exactly about like film distribution in, in like Eastern Europe. In Poland. But I, in Poland, but like, I feel like, they might know the wish of us at this point they might know this like i just um well also... let, but let's let's clue them in as to why we're talking about the wizard of oz okay so yes. so he, he he gets chris kirsten dunce yeah and yeah. Brittany murphy oh, right Brittany after murphy. <laughs> oh yeah so they were in a film called Drop Dead Gorgeous, Brittany Murphy and uh, Kristen Dunst. And so Dustin Hoffman grabs him with Mimi Rogers. And so here's the plot. Kristen Dunst does not want to go to her family Seder. She's at a tattoo parlor and at the last second decides, I'm not going to go. I'm not, I'm going to get my tattoo. I'm going to go to the Seder. And I have Holocaust survivors who are at the Seder. And she doesn't care about any of it. And for those who aren't, familiar with it at a passover seder we drink wine we're supposed to have four glasses of wine so there's a part in the seder near the end after you're good and intoxicated where that a child gets up and opens up the door for the prophet elijah to come in and he drink his cup to of our wine. seder anyway <laughs> and he's going to bless the table and he's going to drink a bottle and everybody shakes the table so they can see him drinking it and i know my parents used to do that too <laughs> So she goes to open the door for Elijah and she walks into 1943 Poland. 
And then she just and experiences the entire Holocaust, basically. Like she does, and everybody knows that she's there, and everybody knows she's from the future. And everybody. Okay, so here's the thing: they they don't know she's from the future. They keep going, "Oh, Hannah, you have such an imagination." <laughs> she keeps saying things about the future, and everyone will be like, "Oh, that's so interesting. Please, this is fascinating. You're such a storyteller, Hannah." Such a storyteller. <laughs> Tell us more about the future, Hannah, who hasn't been there. <laughs> and then she starts the babble. And I just have to say from a Holocaust standpoint, she's in a she's in a labor camp that they're trying to make ambiguous like a death camp. Yeah. And uh and and so they're sitting around in the barracks and she's and they and, and she's trying to comfort these girls. And they say, tell us what'll happen in the future. And the first thing she says is, Well, after the Holocaust, the Jews will go to America. What will um, they eat? what will they eat and then you go ahead <laughs> well first she tells them about pizza and she has to explain the concept of pizza to them and then she tells them about cheeseburgers and then she says oh but if you're jewish that probably wouldn't be kosher they would be veggie burgers and then she begins to tell them the entire story of the wizard of oz uh, tell us just one more story just one more once upon a time there was a girl named dorothy she lived with her dog Toto in Kansas. So can the thing that bothers me about this movie conceptually is that the universe decides to punish a child because she wanted to get a tattoo and she was a little bit uninterested in two of her elderly relatives. Not all of them, because she's interested in her aunt or cousin, Ava, the Rivka, the, the one who she meets, who's Brittany Murphy in the past. She's interested in her history and she asks her a question at one point and the aunt is like, not now, I, I can't unload my trauma right now. Why don't you tell me more about her? <laughs> you wouldn't understand. So it's literally just those two older uh, uh, relatives of hers who she's like, I'm a little bit distracted right now. I don't have time to sit and have you tell me this story right now. And it's that and a tattoo. And the cosmos decide to punish a child and make her experience the entire Holocaust because of these crimes. <laughs> well, but, but she, she's not really punished because she makes it back alive. She wakes up I mean, like, like Dorothy at the end. Yeah, Spoiler but, alert. Yeah, she, she wakes up surrounded by everybody in full who is black the and same. white for a second, and she does the whole and, and she, you were there and scarecrow and, then, and I oh missed my you the God, most. It's terrible, but then they have the gall to go back to color and then do the whole oh so my she's, aunt. So so she wasn't punished by anything except for redemption, except for knowledge. But like, I mean, imagine she was tor then, You could say she was tormented a little bit. I mean, she ex she experienced being gassed. I'm like that, show girl, she, that girl. That girl should be traumatized. The way they handle it, it's very right. unclear. I'm like that part of it's that part of being gassed. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman makes an educational video about the Holocaust for 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 young kids, and the penultimate scene is in a gas chamber with yes, pellets yes. dropping. It is it is such a, a, an example of people who get out of their lane and don't know anything about what they're doing. The and I love at Dustin the end Hoffman. of the movie. At the end of the movie, they're singing Kagaya, and she's smiling, and I'm like, that girl yeah. should be a puddle. That girl was she, not okay. There, all you needed was to sit in a gas chamber and I'm she's- just, I'm just, I'm, I cannot with the movie's sort of central thing of like being a little bit childish and not having a full attention span all the time. I'm like, cause I remember being a child, I listened, but also sometimes I didn't. And it's just like, just basic levels of immaturity and considering getting a tattoo. But but you keep focusing on the plot and I keep focusing on the intent. I can't yeah. believe I can't believe that 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 thinking adults allowed this to happen. All right. Uh, all right, all right. Let's go to forget me not colon the Anne Frank story. Behind the scenes of this movie because i did lk tell me behind the scenes 
Okay, because I like just the opening. I don't know if you saw the version where it has the opening for the In Search of Heroes video series that they these people made. The version I watched had that opening in front of it, which I can only describe as other cultures trauma set to Back to the Future music. <laughs> It was produced by Grace Products. The name Grace Products really gave a vibe. It's written and directed by Fred Holmes, whose filmography is mostly episodes of Barney. <laughs> but it was made as part of this series they did called In Search of Heroes, which like they did like uh, uh, Harriet Tubman, but they also did like Buffalo Bill. They did one for Buffalo Bill. And then they also did one called The Pioneer Spirit about like a sports guy from Texas. So I was like, what is this? Um, so I looked into these people. Uh, after making these quote films, these two, Greg Vaughn and Fred Holmes, ran Grace Products Company. Later, they wrote a book together called Letters to Dad about teaching men to write to God or something. Greg is a contributor to the Christian website Focus on the Family, which definitely hates abortion rights and probably hates gay people. So those are the people who made this movie, uh, Forget Me Not Colin, the Anne Frank story, which- They probably don't know that in the uh, unabridged Anne Frank diary, that she talks a lot about her body parts. Yeah, they like, probably don't know. They probably, listen, listen, the the Nazi with the Party City eye patch that I want, that was so big, I was kind of hoping it would get bigger in every scene with like an accent that is so baffling. It's it's barely even an accent. It's just occasionally an intonation, but he, he loves jam. It's his one weakness. I love jam. It's a weakness of mine, I'm afraid. Tell the nice folks what happens in this movie. Oh boy, okay. So a young man intrigued by neo-Nazism gets time traveled back to Anne Frank to learn that Jews are people. And by the way, intrigued, he has a swastika tattoo on his arm. I kept yelling intrigued while watching this movie. I watched it with a friend over Discord and every now and again, he would do something and I'd be like intrigued 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 you say uh because like yeah intrigued swastika on his arm intrigued um he like goes into faces a fake museum that's supposed to be the simon wiesenthal center but it was filmed in plano texas and i can't really imagine that the real simon wiesenthal center would have um displays that are this off-putting i feel like this is just what white gentiles feel like when they enter a museum about bigotry because it's all like you're a bigot you're a bigot and then yeah he gets time traveled back to anne frank uh there's a weird romance between him and anne frank like peter van pels gets jealous at one point it's um also, uh, the guy, the neo-Nazi kid, um, I feel like was uh, directed to walk like a punk. I can only describe it that way. The way he walks, just like, <laughs> is the funniest thing I've ever seen. This movie's hilarious. It's a, a human rights violation. So the kid walks into the, into the Simon Wiesenthal Center already to deface the place. He does. He's, and, he draws some swastikas. Okay. And then he and then he runs into this curator who Yeah, this librarian character who I think might be a character in this whole series of films. I think he mm. might be like a recurring character. This wacky old man who's like, oh, have you heard of Anne Frank? Here's her diary. And he's like, no, I don't know about Anne Frank. Put me back. And then he gets time travel. Abracadabra. Yeah. He ends up in Anne Frank's attic. Yeah. Well, oh with God. Anne Frank. I and and then he gets taught a lesson about just like frankly I guess just are people just, yeah just, no but he gets taught a, a redemptive lesson just like Kristen Dunst does in Devil's Arithmetic I can't and believe they went all the way to Bergen Belsen in this movie he comes back and he's a better person listen at least the jam came back Chekhov's jam he loved jam that was his one weakness they should have <laughs> 
what they should have had Chekhov's gun over the over the mat on the hearth. That was because if we had started there, then we would have ended with him dead. But we didn't Which get she there. had been. <laughs> But, um, yeah, but so yeah, no, that, um, that movie's an embarrassment. Everybody yeah, but, made but it just be just to be clear, if you send somebody who knows about the Holocaust back to Anne Frank's attic, you think he would warn her? <laughs> well, he doesn't initially. He's you doing think he'd do something. You think that somehow. The, he doesn't seem to know Anne Frank's story. That's the whole thing. Is he doesn't know who Anne Frank is. Nobody he knows what happened. Is, he, he he knows what happens in the Holocaust. Yeah, he does. But like, and, and, it's just so. Oh my God, the Bergen Belson scene is really bad. He's a bad actor when it comes to crying. Oh, Anne. Yeah. Anne. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's really bad. Anyway, I, let's... I think I wrote I think I wrote in my book about that, yeah. that it, it was the kind of film that you feel like you have to shower after watching. I'm just saying for me personally, I would need a shower after the singing forest. <laughs> so, you know, people people ask me, what is the worst Holocaust film ever made? And and I'm I'm reticent to say it publicly because I don't want people to watch it because it is so hideous. It is hideous in in every possible way. On a basic craft level, it's barely a movie. It 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 makes the room look sophisticated. It makes that it, it does. It, there, there's nothing in it. it okay, so the, here's before we get deep into the plot, I have to tell you that I think there might be multiple edits of this movie circulating because the one that I watched on Tubi was an hour and nine minutes. But when I looked up a review of this movie, the length was listed as 90 and somewhere else said an hour and 12 minutes. I suspect that what got cut was probably some sex scenes, but um. I don't know. I'm wondering if maybe some parts of it made more sense if there was more movie that was cut. Because um, I didn't see a lot of the past stuff except for some very shaky cam nightmare sequences. Well, first of all, it's like cutting gangrene. So you're you're just... <laughs> you're I just, just like, really... I was wondering if it, I'm, I'm sure it didn't make the movie better but i was wondering if it made parts of it make more sense because i felt like i was barely even able to follow what was happening at times like so the plot of the singing forest is that this guy has been in touch with a psychic he has a dead wife don't worry about it but like he's been in touch with a psychic who says that he was alive during World War II. His past self was alive during World War II, apparently was a resistance fighter or something and that he had a lover a man and then um his daughter who's named destiny destiny brought them together i'm not over that um his daughter named destiny has a has a fiance named ben i think and ben is apparently the reincarnation of the father's lover from from world war ii and male, now i'm not male lover yeah yeah um now the part i'm not clear on was one of them a Nazi? Because there are posters where one of them has a swastika armband. And the movie I watched, I genuinely couldn't figure out if one of them was a Nazi in the past. Well, let's 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 read the IMDB summary. Two lovers are killed during the Holocaust. One reincarnates first. I did not know that that was a verb. He has a 22-year-old daughter who falls in love with who her father believes is his past life lover and yeah so they don't specify but the poster has a man with a swastika armband and i i spent half the movie being like was one of them a nazi is one of them a nazi is the poster well, as long as, stupid <laughs> as long as we're on imdb imdb lists it this 2003 film the singing forest as an hour and 35 minutes and its rating <laughs> is one its rating is 1.9 out of 10. And it has a Metacritic 
of 1%, which I'm sure is rounding up. Um, so, uh, and, and my ver what, the, the, what I have on my system, my, my copy of it is an hour 35. Uh, and in my book, I listed at 72 minutes. So it's a, it's, it's a shit show, no matter how you look at it. Um, also, um, there's the plot line that apparently destiny is like the reincarnated ghost that of of his wife's daughter. Like his wife was apparently assaulted, sexually assaulted. There's a scene of it. It's unclear if the husband assaulted her or if the husband rescued her from being assaulted. Because again, this movie is incomprehensible. But this destiny is like the ghost baby from that assault apparently <laughs> the wikipedia says the singing forest has the rare has a rare zero percent rating on rotten tomatoes <laughs> good and it's on their list of worst reviewed films there's um, so, so many parts of but this it's not bizarre it's not just it's not just that the plot is plotting and it's it's like it was shot as a student film oh, with, yeah, no, with actors is. who can't act who with with unfo it's like physically unfocused my it's favorite is actually the destiny actress i thought she was doing the best but it's only because there's one line where she just very very passive aggressively says what are we having for dinner shit pie and i thought that was funny pies there's nothing going on here uh, how about dessert? Uh, does anyone want dessert? We're having shit pie. I'll have some dessert. Let it, don't watch it. Ignore what we said. Don't yeah, ever like, see it. I will show you clips to illustrate so you don't have why to. it's, yeah, these clips will be enough. Don't watch it. Um, The part that made me angriest was when they said the Jews got the pink triangles in the camps. I was like, this is basic shit. You're getting basic shit wrong. Like I'm not even talking because you get you get very particular in your book about some details of like tattoo stuff and 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 like the numbering systems and things like that. Like this is basic shit. The pink yeah. triangle was for for uh, arrested queer people during the Holocaust, and Jews got the yellow star. That's basic shit. I was I was in I was enraged. <laughs> I got it. I got to say, though, there was there was a Star Trek episode where you can't if you if you look at this inside the box at this bright light thing, you'll go crazy. Don't do it. Don't look at this bright light. But that's this movie. Don't look at it. We look at it for you. <laughs> Don't look, yeah, looking at it's it's the Gom Jabbar, you know, the put your hand in the pain box in Dune. We put our hand in the pain box from Dune so you don't have to. We'll be scarred for life because we watched it for you. Not just us, my friend watched it with me because I needed somebody to scream with. I subjected my friend to this movie and I feel so bad for them. But all right, now tell me about the other movie that I feel like Anybody who's seen it needs a shower. Auschwitz 2011 by Uwe Boll. Well, you got the background on the dude, so you you talk about you you talk the about him is, I first. Just, I just know I just know he's one of those filmmakers like Neil Green, like Tommy Wiseau. He's uh, he's prolific, and his movies are horrendous. He makes bad movies and I've not sat through a whole movie by him, but I know him. He's infamous and and makes bad movies. So I turned on that trailer you sent me and he says, hello, I'm Uwe Boll. And I went, ah, <laughs> it's, out, and it's called Auschwitz. And you've now shown me clips that are horrendous, but apparently you sat through this whole movie. So yeah i don't I, yeah I, I don't comment on movies without going through the whole thing from a production standpoint he starts it with kids ask them in german to ask some questions about <clears throat> what they know about the holocaust and about auschwitz and then he goes through a, a history that then he reenacts the creation of auschwitz and then he reenacts uh the actual use of of it 
It's and... really graphic. Just the clips that I saw, like if we show anything from it, I'm going to have to blur a lot because it is insanely graphic for how like and and very exploitatively so like not not the purposeful kind where like we're being thoughtful here it's just shock value bad exploitively not yeah. good exploitively uh, although Listen, i don't know what good ex i don't he, know but people could be purposeful about showing that imagery and then sometimes yeah but but being exploitative in, in an artful way is, is just called being andy warhol i mean you're not uh, it, it, it there's a purpose to what he does yeah. To, to what Andy Warhol did, he was poking fun at that exploitativeness. Yeah. In this case, this guy, you bowl your buddy, he has 20, count them, 20 films that each are below a rating of four on IMDb. Who's funding this guy? Uh, how does he, he might just how be does independently he, wealthy. <laughs> He's made 31 feature films. He might just be independently wealthy and nobody's been able to stop him yet. <laughs> I don't know. He, but I, I, I have to say this. Like Dustin Hoffman, he, he was trying to, he was trying to do something. They always he was trying, are. <laughs> he was really, really trying to help. I, I, I don't, I don't think that. I don't I, I don't look at it as I look at the singing for, force, which was just plain grotesque in how it was trying to leverage co-opt the story of the Holocaust, at least of the three films, The Devil's Arithmetic and The Singing Forest. And of yeah. all the films, he yeah. he of all the of all the bad films he's trying opera, to make an almost documentary it sounds like yeah he's trying to he, he and, and i'll also say that that more than a dozen films have been made which try which have documentary footage holocaust films that have documentary footage and reenactments uh and only one of them ever worked uh, it's a it's very that hard Frank film that you like, right? Right. My, my, my daughter, Anne Frank. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, uh, he, he doesn't even sniff it, uh, but, but still he tried. And, yeah. and, and at the end of it, he, he goes back and tries to clean it up too with these kids. But the fact that you're, the, the fact that you are super duper graphic in a Holocaust film if if there is ever a question about whether or not as graphic as you are me, makes it co correlates to authenticity or to quality yeah this puts it to rest and the corollary to that is schindler's list <laughs> so schindler's list <clears throat> also in a completely different way. Uh, he, he's, he's just in terms of, of that other film, he's graphic and he shows things. And again, just because you're showing things in a, that, that are so hyper graphic doesn't make it good. It just makes it bone chilling. The stuff is put in there to make us watch it as opposed to to tell a story just just to upset us just like indiana jones in uh, in a pit with snakes just for shock value it sounds like a lot of your issue beyond just the film itself is how it's overshadowed because you call it the black hole of holocaust cinema and because it has become the de facto movie that people think of when they think of Holocaust films. Do you want to explain why that is upsetting to you? <laughs> it's because everything in the Holocaust universe revolves, gets sucked into the Schindler's List comparison and paradigm. And that would be fine if it were a great film, but it's not. It's, first of all, a study of a Nazi saving Jews from Germans, which is only, it wasn't done. So 
he found one guy. It's true. The, the Schindler's List is, is a true story, but Spielberg, who I respect a lot, and has given all the profits of Schindler's List to the Shoah Foundation. He's never embarrassed the Jews. He's a good guy. But he's the only person who could have taken this guy and who was a Nazi, who was active, who had been a spy, who, who didn't care when the first five million Jews were killed, five and a half million Jews. Were killed. He took this guy and turned him into a god. And he had Jewish cutouts along the way to prop up this guy, this repulsive Nazi who redeemed himself. And good, there are at least 12 other films about Gentiles who saved more Jews than Oscar Schindler did. But their problem was is that Steven Spielberg didn't read their book. And didn't they, they, they didn't get all go and, and they suffered. Many of some of them were killed. Most of them were disgraced by their governments afterwards. Um, and and uh, so that's the first thing. Claude Lanzmann, who, who made the great Holocaust documentary called Shoah, said what he's done is turn the Holocaust on its ear to make it about this German. And as Stanley Kubrick said, who was trying to make a Holocaust film at the same time, Aryan Papers, which was never made, he said the Holocaust was about 6 million Jews dying, not about 600 Jews being saved, which, um, okay, it was 1,100 Jews in Schindler's List. But, um, but anyway, the other issues I have with Schindler's List are that part of what we judge when we review films is the economy with which they tell a story. And Schindler's List is an hour and a half story, which he schleps out for three and a quarter hours. It wasn't a more complicated story than any other, except that he made it more complicated. I also, um, there's, a, there's a shower scene, a shower fake out scene. Yes, uh, about this. And he takes these Jews off a train who would have no idea what gas chambers are would have no idea how they're going to die. Maybe they know they're going to die. Puts a thousand of them in a room. Apparently, they all knew by the time they got in that room that those shower heads may be delivering gas, which they didn't. The, the, the gas chambers had shower heads, but the gas didn't come out of the shower heads. And these people were not in a gas chamber. You can see pictures of gas chambers, and you can see what they had in Schindler's List. And it's not the same because... The shower rooms were shower rooms. They didn't, they weren't dual purpose. And so here you have 70 seconds of the audience. They can't believe they're about to see these people gassed. It's a scare it, film moment. It's a scare, yeah. Wes Craven. It's a Wes Craven scene. <laughs> it is, I, I believe, it, I don't remember if you said this, but it was it, like the equivalent of basically going boo during a Holocaust film. Like it's it's that equivalent. Uh, no, but I'll steal it. Um, I, I The scene at, at the end, as he's standing over, his shadow is over the grave of Oscar Schindler and the, and we have the fourth wall with the people who they portrayed or their family members, which is the most tear jerking scene. This is a- The craft a, is, is not the problem. He is a very talented filmmaker. <laughs> the craft is the problem. Well, it's he's how the craft so is talented. <laughs> he's so talented that, that he had, that this bad witch has used his, his intense powers to make something that makes everybody think that it's that that it is the bomb and it's not it's just I hate it as much as you do but i definitely understand your viewpoints i don't hate it i i i i i don't think that anything in it is malicious i don't think that anything in it is for the most part, aside from the shower scene, historically incorrect. He certainly uh, had uh, the the best intentions. There's, I don't, I, 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 there are films that I hate. I hate uh, uh, every film that we've mentioned up to now. And, and, and 
th this film, I just think, since it is essentially the standard bearer for the genre, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that it couldn't have been a better film. Um, anyway, go see, go see it. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> That's a movie you can watch. I just think you should watch some other ones while you're at it. Uh, I think you should have some perspective about it. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And and, and again, God bless him. The, 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 the testimonies of, of tens of thousands of Holocaust survivors were made possible by his generous gifts. Uh, and I also um, uh, should say that he's been very supportive of the gray zone, which we'll talk about. Well, next, let's knock out why the boy in the striped pajamas is a bad movie. Well, so about this really nice man, this just family man, this cool, wonderful guy in Berlin, who happens to be a Nazi officer, and he has this great family, and they get he gets a new assignment, and he, they end up in this town in the middle of Poland with these smokestacks, and he's in charge of the place. And his mother-in-law knows what he's doing, or his mother. His wife doesn't really understand what he's doing, and his little boy, oh, so cute. Also Butterfield, his, biggest little blue eyes on that kid. He's 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 a very adorable little baby. <laughs> and and he wanders out, this little six-year-old, eight-year-old boy, he wanders out and he sees another boy on the other side of the high voltage barbed wire. And he starts to dine with him and they play ball and and nobody gets accidentally get, electrocuted or seen. Any of them get near that thing. And their guard towers, the guards don't quite see this, and they can They're tunnel. They're so little. Under. They're so, so little that the guards <laughs> don't see them. And of course, you have it assumes that you would have had a child who would have been an Auschwitz inmate, which the chances of that being were pretty slim. Yeah. De minimis. And 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 so you have this kid who who uh the, the commandant's son who's bringing picnic <laughs> to, to the destitute, starved. And, and, and then he says, well, um, uh, why don't you, the, the, the commandant's kid says, why don't you come over for, to join us for, for supper sometime? And he says, well, I can't. He says, why? He says, well, I can't leave here. He says, I thought that was just for animals. No. I can't leave. Why can't you? Because I'm Jewish. This and, is one of the I'm, most emotionally manipulative films I have ever seen. And the commandant's kid goes, oh, I have to go now. I have a, I have to, I got to go now. And, and, and then at the end of the film, the only thing that could have happened, the only time I, I could ever be happy about someone dying in a gas chamber is that this commandant kid walks into it it's the only way it could have ended yeah no the little boy the, the 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 little jewish boy says he can't find his father so asa butterfield says i'll help you find your dad and somehow they smuggle him his own auschwitz uniform also baby size again how did they find it but then the two of them basically wander in. The they want they, they just they just happen in they yeah just... they do they just sort of stumble <laughs> into it and die and then his mother <laughs> suddenly realizes oh my god you've been running a death camp and there's like the smoke stack you see the smoke and she's like <gasps> vera farmiga just like oh my goodness gracious me um yeah no it's it's a it's a very bad movie um and, and i but i I, I love I love the actor who plays the commandant, David. Who's who he's he's uh, he's a treasure. Lots of Butterfield is a good actor too. He's great in Hugo and Sex Education. Like all of these are talented actors. These are these are unlike the Singing Forest. These are real movies. Uh, so all of the actors are talented. That's not the problem. It's the and the production is beautiful. Yeah. And and and, and but uh, I'm. 
just the, the mechanics of the whole thing of of thinking that the Zondo commander would just like walk this kid in and that and and that and that the the Jewish kid thinks that this other boy is going to be able to help him find his father who he wouldn't know what he looks like I mean, how's how's he going to help find I'm more, his father I'm more, I'm more concerned about how Asa Butterfield thinks he's going to help find his dad I'm like little kids little kid logic is a thing of its own but how does Asa Butterfield think he's going to help find this kid's dad because <laughs> he knows he doesn't know what he looks like <laughs> I I I, I and, and the the thing about the film is so disheartening is that so many people love it. It drives yeah. me crazy. It's I, again, I, this I, is this is one of the more infamous films that people have seen, unfortunately. And there are certain countries that, that 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 venerate it. Like I've heard that in New Zealand and in, in Australia, it's 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 a BFD. I'm just I just know that that it's a big deal in some in in some countries. And yeah. uh I would I, I see Schindler's List before you see that. Yeah, no, Schindler's <laughs> List is a better movie than this. Um, speaking of movies that Schindler's List is better than, please tell me about The Reader. The Reader. I know I need to see The Reader. The Reader is a, is a curious idea about payment and about skills. Here you have Kate Winslet at her most ravishing, playing an East German woman 10 years after the war who is illiterate. And so she makes this bargain, this deal, this commercial deal with a boy that he'll read to her and in exchange, he'll have sex with her. The commerce part of it, I didn't get. Yeah, it does seem like she's getting all of the bonuses really from this situation yeah he was he he was yeah and and then and then we find out that this east german woman was a nazi guard who uh put 300 jews in a barn burned it down and uh and then she goes on trial and she can't defend herself because she's illiterate and so we're supposed to feel sorry for her yeah this movie thinks uh, that's very and, tragic and kate winslet wins the academy award for best actress because i've noticed that if you do a film about the holocaust guaranteed an Oscar. I don't know. I, I don't know the point that they're trying to make. Yeah, I feel like I feel like it's supposed to be from the boy's perspective. And he's like, whoa, I didn't realize I was having sex with a Nazi. Now I have complicated emotions because she's hot. Um, <laughs> and but if she was an ugly Nazi, I wouldn't have complicated emotions. Yes, I think that's what this movie is positing. <laughs> She's Kate Winslet. Like, yeah. Can you please explain the day the clown cried? There was a really, really famous guy named Jerry Lewis. He was born Joseph Levitch. He was he was just enormous. And then and he, but he wasn't known for serious work. The day the clown cried was in 1972. And he produced it, he wrote it, he directed it, and it was about a clown in Auschwitz who tries to cheer up kids. And it, it, in his words, it was bad, bad, bad. And he made sure that in his lifetime, it would never be seen by the general public. Are we going to ever going to get to see the day the clown cried? No. <laughs> no. You want to know why? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was ashamed of the work. And I was grateful that I had the power to contain it all and never let anybody see it. It was bad, bad, bad. But I s slipped up. I didn't quite get it. I'll tell you how it ends. <laughs> uh, and when he died in uh, 2014, he gave it to the National Archives in America. Uh, with the proviso that it could not be seen for 10 years. So in 2024, we all get to see this film that is this infamous film where Jerry Lewis makes a fool of himself in Auschwitz. And you can go onto YouTube and you can see clips of it. You can see things of it. You can see what he's trying to do. 
the there's a, a Holocaust film that was made many years later called The Last Butterfly, which I highly recommend, which is very similar to it, where um, the uh, the Nazis take a, an actor, a clown, a, a, a performer, and they get him to go to Theresienstadt, a, a, con a, a fake model, con a concentration camp that was uh, the, the Germans used to fake out the Red Cross by pretending that the Jews were well taken care of. And so they forced him to do a performance for these with these kids for the Red Cross. And then afterwards, he's he he goes off with them to their death and um, to Treblinka. And so whether or not the last butterfly could have been made without the aborted, the day the clown cried, I don't know. But uh, at, just as allegorically to, to be able to, 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 to compare two films that had the same intention and uh, one was able to do it and one wasn't, these are, this is a great example of it. All right, well, now, let's talk about some good movies some actual good movies that we think you should see and let's start with conspiracy from 2001. so the germans had a meeting in vance a suburb of berlin and it was in 1942. it was called by heidrich who was two steps below Hitler, and by his assistant Eichmann. Most people think that the Wannsee Conference was about the decision to build Auschwitz and to have the, and for the final solution. It's not true. The Wannsee Conference was about the, 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 these people at the top consolidating power and taking, having the leaders of the military the judiciary, the political Nazis, and the industry all in a room and say to them, we're doing it, it's going to be done, and either you're going to be helping us do this and you're not going to give us any problems or you're going to be on the next train. And There's a lot um, about the mechanics of it because they're, they're already doing it, so there's a lot about the exact mechanics of how they're going to solve the Jewish problem. The conference itself was about an hour and a half, which is the length of the movie. And it stars Kenneth Brown and Stanley Tucci and Colin Firth. And their performances are impeccable. And it, it apparently started a, a life along, a, a, a they, they've had a bromance ever since. Oh, that's, uh, that's amazing. I've seen them interviewed and they say, oh, we worked on this Nazi thing together. Uh, but the most stark thing about the film, the reason it is such a, a potent film, is because it's so clinical in the approach to what they're doing. They call it evacuations. They like they're they're all talking in code all the time. So like they're not saying we're going to murder six million Jews. They're saying we're going to evacuate, and they're like going through the numbers of like the different populations that like they have to dispose of. They have to evacuate them. It's very calculated that you could do all this without any of the tricks they went to the original place they shot it there they didn't One of the screw things around that i thought was really good as well was the way the film focuses a lot on like the luxury of it all there's just a lot of focus on like the sort of the beauty of the locale and how sort of rich and and i don't know gentrified that this these people are so they get to sit in luxury and drink nice wine and smoke nice cigars while they discuss the systematic murder of six million Jewish people. And it's in it, the contrast of it is very startling. And so the, the Germans had spent a lot of time since Nuremberg trying to classify it. That was, an, they, they'd spent a lot, of, they'd spent almost 10 years trying to justify through their laws and judiciary what a Jew was and what a Jew wasn't and how we're going to utilize these people. And it, it becomes 
irrelevant because they're not in Germany. They're not talking about the, Jew, the Jews of Germany anymore. They're talking about the Jews in everywhere but Germany. They're talking about the Jews in conquered lands who are not, uh, uh, who, who, who don't fall under the jurisdiction of these German laws. And, and so the judiciary is still trying to figure out why shouldn't our rules apply? What a half Jew is, what a quarter Jew is, how and, they... and they're so they're so casual about the way they're discussing like half of them want to sterilize the population and half of them are concerned about just having a labor force yeah but that well half of them want a labor force want yeah. a sterilized labor force and half yeah. them want them dead and yeah. and and you're sitting there saying because anybody who even has a cursory knowledge of the holocaust knows that the germans may have won the war if they had not screwed with the Jews. I mean, if they'd not spent all of their energy trying to kill the Jews, then I they would have had the they resources. Have with Russia. <laughs> but they would have had the resources to win. Mm. But that, but there's so many resources that they that they use to run the, the 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 Holocaust, and and that's what a lot of people during this Vonsei conference are saying. We need that labor. We need them to do things, and. And the answer was, we need them dead. And the epilogue to it in the film is just as brilliant as um, in this little conversation that, 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 they, that they share. It, it, it's a great film. It's great it's, movie it's making. A good movie. And I've oh, fallen in love with Kenneth Branagh because of it. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 He's a hero of mine because of it. And I, and I was already in love with Stanley Tucci after he appeared in one of my favorite films, Lucky Number Slavin. So Yeah, we are both Stanley Tucci fans. All right, let us move on then to another good movie that we want you to see. It's called 1945. It was made in 2017. Now, can you... Give us a summary of 1945. I sure can. A serious movie. We're being serious now. Very serious movie. So just after the war uh, in a Hungarian town, two Jews who live there get off a train, return from the camps with a trunk filled with something that we don't know, filled with a MacGuffin. We don't yeah. know what it is and we don't care. The town is centered on this pharmacy that the Jews used to own. And everybody thinks that the Jews are coming back to reclaim their property. And during the next hour and a half, the town absolutely unravels as these guys, just like high noon, just slowly make their way back to it. So in every town in Eastern Europe, that when the Jews disappeared, here you are with I mean, they, they could take a suitcase. And so they couldn't take their business or their house or their furniture or anything. And so, uh, and so here you have all of this property and all of these businesses and the town needs a pharmacy and somebody has to run the pharmacy. And there's another film, another great film from 1965, The Shop on Mainstream, Czech, Czechoslovakian film, which shows this process of 1945, shows it after the Holocaust. And the house on Main Street shows it as the just as the Jews are being deported. And this old woman who has a thread shop, a fabric shop, and the, the kid who's coming in to take it over, the, 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 the Gentile who lives in there. Yeah. So, so it's not the same despoilment that, uh, that the Nazis, uh, that, 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 you're, that you contemplate the, the Nazis doing, because it wasn't the Nazis. The no. Nazis just took the Jews away, and the locals um, uh, took the, what was took the stuff. Took it's, the stuff. The the thing that I found really fascinating about this movie was the emphasis on objects. Again, on this luxury that they have. There's all of this beautiful, like silver, and you know the, these beautiful houses, and it's just they took all their stuff. They took all their stuff and in this movie specifically, they outlined that like it sounds like they had some sort of an auction where where basically the townspeople 
bought these homes that were then empty. And so just the the guilt and also um, the main the like the town mayor or whatever he is, it sounds like he specifically like turned in his friend who was Jewish. There was like a specific thing that he did. Um, like they like he had the town drunk and some other people like sign a piece of paper, I guess, turning this guy in or something. Um, but it's just so then we're just focusing on all of this stuff, which is just the visual representation of their culpability. And then you just you just watch the town unwind like they just they just come apart at the seams because they know what they did. Um, this is a movie made to make Gentiles uncomfortable. I loved it. <laughs> like I, I God just, forbid. I, God I, forbid. <laughs> Property doesn't get dealt with a lot in these films, yeah. and this one did. There's there's another film called The Birch Tree Meadow where uh, a woman goes back to Poland, and she goes back to her childhood home. And the reaction of the woman at the door is, this is our place. It's always been our place. Don't bother. And she says, okay, you mind if I come in a second? Come in. And she shows the woman a picture of her father at a fireplace. That's very clearly that. And then you see in the picture that there's a vase in the fire, uh, on the fireplace. And then you look at the fireplace and the same base is there. Yeah. So yeah. clearly, and, and there's another story that I've heard, which is not in a movie, although maybe it should be, where people go, grandkids of survivors go back to the place where their grandparents were hidden during the war, uh, yeah. a, a Gentile home in the basement. And they knock on the door and somebody the, the grandkids answer and so these jewish grandkids say who they are and uh and the grandkids of the polish people say hold on one second and they go down into the basement and come back and you're thinking i mean what are lk what are the other things you're thinking that they would come out with i'm assuming trunks of stuff <laughs> their stuff, their tallest, their whatever. He comes out with a, um, basically with a bill, an accounting of how much the fat, it, it cost to have hidden them and what they were owed. Wow. Wow, yeah. wow, 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 wow. The thing I, I found really interesting about 1945 is because there's just this unspoken kind of guilt underneath everything they're doing because these people know exactly what they did. And right now they're living very comfortably. And the worst thing that could happen to them is the Jews come back and take back their, their homes and their stuff. And so like, they're talking about them like they're boogeymen and it's just two dudes minding their own business and everybody is losing their minds and it was just yeah no it made me angry but like it was great <laughs> well they weren't minding their own business they came but, there for a reason but they didn't say what the reason anybody. they didn't no. say what the reason was if no, they had but they're said, not bothering anybody <laughs> they're just it's... walking through town they're not doing anything they're menacing as as hell well, that's just the filming and it's and it's because it's filmed it feels like it's being shown to us from the gentiles perspective and it's just this is how they're viewing these oncomers that are just yeah. strangers watch the movie i'm not going to say what's in the case what they were there to do but i just yeah no it's phenomenal it's i the last shot of the movie really really stuck with me i i thought it was great people should go watch it. It's in Hungarian, so watch it with subtitles. But like, it's available on Tubi. Tubi weirdly has, a, it's free with um, heinous ads. You'll have to sit through ads and they're, they will interrupt scenes and it's annoying. But like, um, they have weirdly a pretty decent library of Holocaust films, like the obscure ones. There's a lot of them on Tubi. That's where I watched 
most of the movies that we're talking about. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm just, fun fact, I didn't know this, but I learned this in the process of making this movie. You know what else is on Tubi? The Gray Zone. Let's talk about your favorite Holocaust film. All right, now let's talk about what I consider to be the greatest Holocaust film ever made, which I should differentiate from being my favorite Holocaust film. Oh, really? Do you have yes. a different favorite? Or do you just not if do I, favorites? Oh, I totally do favorites, except with my kids. <laughs> um, I, I, look, I can't watch The Gray Zone every day. No. Well, I can't mean, can watch, you watch any of these. Like, are any of these movies that you're just going to put on for a casual sit? Did you see This Must Be the Place? No, I did not get to that one. But is that one your favorite? I It's one of them. The Birch Tree Meadow may be the one about this woman who, who goes back. Uh, Harold and Maude uh, very well could be. But The Gray Zone is the greatest narrative Holocaust film, in your opinion. Ever made. Yes. Right. By All far. Right. We don't kill people. We don't? We put them in the rooms, walk them in and strip them. Look them in the face and say it's safe. What the hell is that? So in Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Birkenau was part of Auschwitz. It, it was the part where most of the killing was done. It was the death factory part. There were groups of workers called Sondo Commando who manned the, the, the entire crematorium operation. They were Jews who were given 12 weeks to live extra to lead the other Jews into the undressing rooms, into the gas chamber, take them out afterwards, harvest their, um, uh, the gold in their hair, uh, yeah. burn them. Uh, and um, for, for doing all of that, they got to eat better and they got to sleep Better. Do you want to look anyone in the face if any of your family's even alive? What you've done for a little more life, for vodka and bed linens. And none of them were ever allowed to escape. Like other people could escape from Auschwitz who didn't, who hadn't seen the process and they wouldn't be necessarily tracked down. But if any Sondo commando escaped, that was a big deal because they knew exactly what happened there. And they could tell people. You live to tell. You're not going to live. You won't make it to the Vistula. Others have made it. Others from the camp, not from the commandos. They'll give up on someone from Buna or the camp, but not anyone who's been inside the crematoria. So this is a true story about the last group of them that decided that they were going to destroy two of the four crematorium. So you start with a story that most people don't know that is about Jews trying to do something positive in an impossible situation. And then you have um, all of the things that you that are required to take a good story and make it into a great film. So the film was directed by Tim Blake Nelson, who written most written by him too. Written by him, edited by him. I didn't know he also apparently it's based off a play of same name that he did first. Play of yes, research. All it's all Tim Blake Nelson, uh, who we know from Coen Brothers films like Oh Brother Where Art Thou and Battle of Billy Scruggs. He's in a film that he executive produced now called Old Henry, which is uh, in the theaters now. It's very good. So Tim, to get this made, he had to rope in his buddies. Um, because no big stars were other bigger stars were going to be in it. So he got David Arquette and Steve Buscemi and, and Mira Savino. Well, so Harvey Keitel came in, but he also came in as a producer. He wasn't just along for the ride. But there are guys who were in, you'd recognize if a lot of the people from other things. Yeah, Natasha Leone from Russian Doll. She's in this. And Mira Servino. Yes. Paul Servino's daughter. So Tim then had learned all of the lessons from other Holocaust films. Don't put in crappy music. Don't put in music at all. Yeah. Don't no violins, none of this stuff. Just hear what's going on around you. Um, 
the the dialogue is as if it had been written by David Mamet. Yeah, it's uh, very it overlapping, very stagey, which makes sense given its origins. And and on and and on several levels, uh, they're saying more than one thing at once, and we hear them all. Our group is happy to remain here. Happy. This is where we would like to remain. Why kill us now? We're the best commando you've had. Did I say kill? We both know what we're saying. So I'm a liar. You're what you are. It's paced perfectly. It's edited perfectly. I really um, love the cinematography, um, the, the choice of what's being shown. Um, it is like surgically precise just the emphasis on the smokestacks of the crematorium at all times you're like always seeing the smoke but sometimes it will just focus on the smokestacks and you know what is coming out of that um and there's a lot of like also just like scenes of them like shoveling ash that like we know what that is there's there's i think only one scene inside the gas chamber that's pretty brief but like mostly you're seeing the before and after steven spielberg was making a movie called minority report and tim blake nelson was an actor in minority report and friends with steven spielberg he, he was acting while he was editing the gray zone that's and trip. tim blake nelson asked steven spielberg to, to look at the film and Spielberg came back uh, the, over the weekend and he said, I love this film and I want to distribute this film through DreamWorks. So Tim Blake Nelson thought that was wonderful. And Steven Spielberg took it DreamWorks and DreamWorks said, no, we, we do not do small films. This is a 400 theater film. We do 3000 theaters. And for better or worse, this film is always going to be compared to Schindler's List. So um it was distributed by other people but i'm reminded of this because if you recall there's a scene where um a woman is is screaming uncontrollably screaming yes. screaming screaming and finally a nazi comes and just shoots her in the face and she yeah. falls and Spielberg said to Tim, because this is this is before digital effects. How yeah. did you get that shot? How were you able to get that? And he said, there was a person off screen with a pea shooter and die and was able to just <laughs> right on there. Oh, my God. That's ridiculous. Um, and the other, the other great story is that another great story is that Tim Blake Nelson took his son to the camps uh, to tour to to Birken, to 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 Birkenau, and and for those who haven't been there, there's a gift shop, <laughs> and uh, it's by the parking lot. When I went there, I was so um, I, I was so aghast by it that I, I there's an article you can read that I wrote called My Trip to Poland, where I show pictures of the the matching refrigerator. Oh my god! <laughs> the the matching refrigerator magnets Auschwitz Birkenau. If you can believe that they're selling this there, nonetheless. Nonetheless. Tim goes into the gift shop and he points up to the shelf and he says next to Schindler's List that there's the gray zone. And the clerk there says it's the greatest Holocaust film ever made. Aww. And Tim didn't say it was his. He just walked out. Aww. And when I was interviewing him about this, he said, it's off the record. I said, there's no way this is off the record. This is such a great story. <laughs> We're just, you, you, it's on the record. He said, okay, but, but you know, it doesn't sound very much. I said, yeah, but it happened. And you made this great film. So I was going to ask, how did you find this film? 
did you like know about it when it was coming out or did you find it after the fact? How did you find the gray zone? Well, nobody really knew about it because it came out the weekend of 9-11. Yeah, and it, it September got lost. 13th, 2001. It really what? got, but it, no, it really came out. It was really September 11th. Like he was oh, supposed really? to have, he uh -huh. was, he, he was at the Toronto film festival and he was supposed to have breakfast with Roger Ebert. And I mean, it, it was really, um, and, uh, and Ebert, by the way, uh, loved the film. Yeah. Loved, loved, loved it. Reviewed it more than once and put it in his best pictures. Um, I, I, when I started teaching about Holocaust films, I got a list of every film that could ever conceivably be a Holocaust film and I watched it. Oh, and so this was just on the, on a long list just, of movies. I, I bought every, I bought DVDs of every Holocaust film that could conceivably be considered a Holocaust film. And, um, Sometimes 90% of the time you're sitting there going, when is this going to end? And 10% of the time you're saying, how could I ever have not known about this? Yeah, this I, so I was so angry, like just that I had never heard of this movie before because it is really, really good. It is definitely up there for movies I am going to recommend to people. I may or may not make a video about it. I don't know. I'm still deciding. I'm getting the I, DVD. I, I I will listen to that cast creator commentary that's on the DVD. I'm very excited to get that. Um, but I had to get it through eBay. It's not even in print on Amazon um, for our region, which I, I'm i still like, I, I don't know how the criterion works. I still think that they could rescue this movie from obscurity. I don't know how they do it, but they do, they do pick up weird little movies that nobody saw that didn't make money. They do it all the time. <laughs> I'll make sure to let Tim Blake Nelson know that. I'm just saying but, there's a suggestions email. People can can bother them. The other point I was going to make was in um, October, I wrote an article the, and a long interview about this for the G yes. JTA. And it was the one of the top most read articles uh, last year. So for those who want to know more about it, first watch the movie and then read the interview because yeah. um, um so uh lk what else you want to talk about i think that this might be the end of it do you want to just like once again remind people about your book <laughs> why don't you remind them about my book because you're the one who's reading it so you're more <laughs> objective than i am um i mean i will say i don't agree with all of your opinions but i do think that it's a really interesting area of scholarship and there's definitely a lot that i learned while reading it so yeah you, you wrote a book about like 400 plus Holocaust films, Rich Brownstein, Holocaust cinema. <laughs> For people trying to teach their students about the Holocaust, I would definitely recommend this book because I have seen some embarrassing attempts at teaching the Holocaust. So I would recommend this book if you're a teacher who has to teach students about this subject matter. It's pretty comprehensive. So yeah. I just want to say one more thing, two what? more things. First, you do a great job and i love okay. your style you you are um you are talent uh and uh, thoughtful and if you are the product of holocaust education even bad holocaust education you listen i did my own education the education i got in school was not particularly useful you you are a gem you are a you, you are absolutely a gem and your your video about Jojo Rabbit uh, was tremendous. Even though I don't like Jojo Rabbit, so thoughtful as I wrote to you originally, and so beautifully made, and uh, it makes me feel uh, secure knowing that that people like you are out there um, and care about this. So that's the first thing. The second thing is self-serving. If you want to find me, you can go to holocaustfilms.com and um and you can uh see everything you want to know about my book and interviews that i've done and written and um mailing address well email and um Good. and uh there you are okay so i couldn't figure out a chill way to end that interview Whee!
But thank you, Rich, for taking the time. It was great. For my viewers, go watch The Gray Zone. It's easy to find digitally, at least, and it's good. But for those who want to hear the news, that is, for those who didn't see the news on my community tab or Twitter, I got a proper post-production job that is a big deal for my long-term career goals. Yay! That doesn't mean I'll stop making videos, but it means production of them will slow down, and I don't really know how much yet. The Rise of the Guardians video is almost three quarters of the way done, but my mic crapped out last month. That's why this audio sounds garbage. I'm using the same headset mic I used in the interview, and I'm still waiting for the new microphone to arrive, so I'm sorry. It's coming soon. The video will be done soon, I promise. So thank you all for watching. You've been great. I'll see you on the next one.